A bit of news in our diocese, Cardinal Keeler died this week. He served as our Archbishop, I believe, for 14 years. He's been ill for the past several years, being cared for by the Little Sisters of the Poor. But he passed uh, this past week, and his funeral will be Tuesday. So one of the great Archbishops of our diocese, we're very grateful for his service and his sacrifices. Please do pray for him this week. Uh, there'll be more information coming out, hopefully through email, with details of his funeral. It will be televised on Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock. So anyone's welcome to attend at the cathedral, but also to follow uh, through the media. These past few weeks of Lent, we've been reflecting upon the last words of Christ, the seven last words. Usually when someone's dying, we hang on their dying words. We, we attach greater significance to them. What do they want to say before they leave? What's a great word of wisdom or a sign of affection for us? So too with Jesus, we trust that there's nothing random, nothing unconsidered in his last words, his last chance to teach us. So we put great significance to them. So this week we look at the fourth and the fifth word. The first word was, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Jesus revealing God's great forgiveness no matter what we do. Even if we kill God, he'll forgive us if we say we're sorry. And then the second week, he turned to the thief who was being executed with him. And he said, you will be with me in paradise today. God's great generosity. Here's a man who was sinful, a sinner, a criminal. Right before he died, he said, I'm sorry. And God said, I'll take it. You're going to go to heaven today. Of course, God could see in his heart he was truly sorry. And then the third word as he was dying, he's, Mary was standing by the foot of the cross, and he turned to his friend John, the apostle. He said, John, behold your mother. She was my mother for 33 years. Now she is your spiritual mother, the spiritual mother of all Christians. Mary continues to have significance for us. That's why we honor her today. She continues to intervene. She appears at different moments of history to challenge and encourage us. So today, the fourth and the fifth word from the cross. The fourth word is, I thirst. And the fifth word, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It's a very human thing, right? We get thirsty. If we, don't, if we go out without water for a certain amount of time, a few days, we'll die. It's essential for human life. But it's kind of amazing today how the market is glutted with products to drink. It's a very American phenomenon. You go to the store to get a drink, and there's three walls of refrigerated cases of drinks. they got to like, have labels and categories of drink. And even if you just want to get water, well, do you want purified water? Do you want spring water? Do you want sparkling water? Do you want sports water? Do you want fluoridated water? We call that tap water. I just want water. I don't know. We have decaffeinated drinks, and then we have uber-caffeinated drinks. We've got monster drinks. You've got your sodas, your sugar section. You've got your sugar-free section. You've got your hot drinks. You've got your cold drinks. So much variety of drinks just to satisfy our human thirst. There's a big market. We are thirsty, apparently. Really thirsty people. I think Americans especially. So Jesus was thirsty. That's the first significance. He had been captured the Holy Thursday night, kept in prison all through the night, through Friday morning. Now Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, he's dying. He's been tortured. He's been whipped. He's been beaten up. They probably gave him nothing to drink. Why should they? They're going to kill him. So he says from the cross, I thirst. He was suffering. And that teaches us a lot about God, that God entered into the human experience. He cares about what we go through. He went through it too. As we say, he walked the walk. He doesn't always take away our problems, but he cares intensely about them. He has compassion. He enters, he walks with our passions, our sufferings. He's there. He understands. Some religions believe God is indifferent. He just looks down on earth. We're his big science project, right? Right? Sometimes you create a little environment within like a 
an aquarium tank, right? Some people think Earth is God's aquarium tank, right? Like pokes on the window. We call that like a hurricane, right? And God pokes on the window, throws things off. No. God is a father. He's a parent. Very interested in what we go through here, as any parent would be for their children. He's the perfect parent. He thirsted too. But at a deeper level, it was a spiritual thirst. He said, I thirst for you. He's up on the cross looking down. I thirst for you. I thirst for my mother's love. I thirst for my friends, the apostles' love. But I also thirst for these Roman soldiers. I thirst for these Jewish religious leaders. I thirst for the people of Jerusalem. I thirst for the world. I made you because I wanted a creature that would love me. I wanted a creature that was interested in me, that could engage intellectually with me in conversation, that could return affection to me. That's what God, that's, that's, the, that's what human beings are meant to do. It's the only reason God made us. He could have been happy with the, the squirrels and flowers, mountains. They're all beautiful things. We're the only creature that could give something back, and that's, that's our purpose. But we know that sometimes we're not thirsty for God, are we? Sometimes we're not interested in Jesus. Not even to just pick up one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and just read the story of what he said and did. Sometimes that seems like such a big burden just to do that, doesn't it? It wouldn't take many hours, but most of us probably haven't done it yet. Or those 10 minutes a day or a few minutes a day of prayer or those 60 minutes on Sunday. There's some thirst, right? Or we wouldn't be here this morning. Something has drawn us here. But we know some Sundays it's hard to get here. Part of us doesn't want to do it. And we know plenty of people who don't get here. Plenty of people who never speak of spiritual things. Never seem to pray. But the reality is they do thirst for God. They just don't know it. They thirst, but they don't know what for. But that thirst is never satisfied. St. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless, God, until they rest in you. St. Augustine knew. His mom was Catholic, but he was never baptized. He was a bit of a pagan playboy. He was just doing whatever he wanted to do, seeking pleasure and intellectual curiosity, dabbling in different world philosophies, but not really seeking truth. Living a very promiscuous life, but then he, he had a moment of change. His mom was praying for him the whole time. In a moment of conversion, when he said, That truth that I was seeking intellectually, Jesus told us the truth. It's the most comprehensive explanation of the universe, it's what Jesus taught. And spending time in prayer and contemplating God and inviting the Spirit of God into my soul and receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. Actually, that brings me great peace and joy. Subtle, but real. And he said, now my heart is becoming satisfied. Augustine converted, was baptized, one of the greatest theologians in the history of our Catholic Church. So our hearts are thirsty for God, but sometimes we don't know it's, it's him that we seek. We want to be affirmed, we want to be encouraged, he'll do it. We want someone to love us and experience friendship, that we're lovable, he'll do it. We want meaning and purpose to our life. He'll give it. He has a mission in mind. Mother Teresa, who formed the Missionaries of Charity, in all the chapels of the missionaries around the world, you have a big crucifix and two words next to it, I thirst. Mother said, ladies, women, sisters, the reason we're doing all this charitable work, all this sacrifice, is to satisfy Jesus' thirst. He wants our attention. He wants our effort. He wants our service. He wants our love. So they go in that chapel every day for an hour or two hours and they just contemplate Jesus present in the Eucharist, his image in the crucifix. And their thirst is satisfied. That's where they're refreshed and strengthened to do their work. To care for the poor and the dying and the sick. They're reminded God thirsts for them. He has love for them and he wants their attention so one way we satisfy God's thirst is through that prayer. Showing interest in Him. Reading the scriptures. Learning more about our Catholic faith. The church that He created. 
Another way we satisfy his thirst is by going out and serving others. Remember Jesus said, as often as you did it for one of these others, you did it for me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was without shelter, you provided it. So that somehow when we serve others who are struggling and suffering, we're serving God. Jesus in the poor. So I thirst. So we ask God to deepen our thirst. We pray for others who don't seem to be thirsty. And then his next word from the cross was, O oh God, O oh God, why have you abandoned me? And this is curious. Jesus is God, but he's saying that God has abandoned him. The fact that Jesus was captured and tortured and executed, does that mean that God the Father abandoned him? Where was God? Yeah, that's a fair question. People mocked him. They said, if you're God, come off the cross. Prove it. Or God the Father should free you from the cross. But it didn't happen. Where was God? We've had those experiences of life. God, I'm sick and I need help. Where are you? God, I'm struggling financially. I lost my job. Where are you? God, I was treated unfairly, unjustly. Where are you? God, look at the news. Look how struggling the world is. All this evil. Where are you? We can relate to that word of Jesus from the cross. It, sometimes it seems that God has abandoned us. How do you abandon Jesus? Now what happened at the moment that Jesus died? There was an earthquake. The earth shook. It says the sun was dark and there was an eclipse. The temple building in Jerusalem shook and it said the walls cracked and the big veil, the big curtain separating the sanctuary and the Ark of the Covenant from the rest of the church was a veil, the curtain was ripped. Oh, God was there. He was showing. Oh, yeah. I'm shaking the earth. I'm not really happy about what's going on here. I sent my son to you and you killed him. I'm here. But I'm not going to stop it because something good's going to come out of it. So don't despair. The night before Jesus died, he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup away. I, I don't really want to do what I have to do tomorrow, but if it's your will, I, so be it. It was God the Father's will. And what was the good that came out of it? Christian theology teaches that if Jesus did not die for us, we would all go to hell. Every human being on earth would go to hell, would be eternally separated from God. Because we sin, we don't deserve to go to heaven. You can't earn heaven. We all sin in different ways. There's the effect of sin on our soul when we're conceived. So we deserve to be punished, but Jesus said, I'll be punished for them on their behalf. And as a result, now we can go to heaven. Not because we deserve it, because Jesus asks for it. So if a Hindu person goes to heaven, it's only because Jesus died for them, whether they know that or not. If an atheist is able to go to heaven, it's only because Jesus died for them. Something very good came out of something very bad. And so that's the challenge for us, is when we're struggling, when things seem unfair, when we pray and it doesn't seem that God is answering. It's just not in his time or in his way. Recently, I was ministering to a family where a young man had a brother and his brother died young in his 20s and this kind of shattered the son's faith. He stopped going to church. How could this happen? God, I prayed. I went to church on Sunday and my brother died. I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not praying anymore. Right? We see that happen sometimes. But that young man didn't realize, didn't you know there's young people dying all the time? Every time you drive past a hospital, there's a lot of suffering, a lot of drama, a lot of tragedy there. You drive past a prison, a lot of suffering and tragedy there. You watch the news. Look what's going on around the world every day. The message is, there always was and there always will be injustice and sickness and struggle. But that doesn't mean God's not there. We just need to be a little more realistic so that when it happens to us, it doesn't shatter us. It's not easy to deal with those things until we experience it, right? But be realistic. It's happening around us. Be a little more compassionate. But on the other hand, you see people who 
aren't thirsty for God, aren't praying, aren't going to church, and then they get sick, and then they become interested in God. So something bad happens to them, and it has a good effect. There was a man who was a friend of a friend of mine, and she said, my friend's dying, can you go visit? I said, is he Catholic? No. Oh, does he go to church? No. But you want me to visit him? Yes. Okay. So I went and visited a few times in the nursing home. We had very deep conversations. He said, I don't see the point of any of this. I don't get it. I said, I'm not sure, but have you ever had an hour conversation with a Catholic priest before? <laughs> no. Well, that's something unusual that came out of this sickness. He died, but he was a prayerful man when he died. We're all going to die, but are we going to be ready to die? So God doesn't abandon us, but we just have to say, Lord, help something good come out of what seems so bad. God, maybe you're not going to take it away, but help sustain me. Help me to carry this cross, this pain, this suffering, this confusion, this hurt. That's what he wants to do is help us carry it. Sustain us for perseverance. To have peace in the midst of it. So my brothers and sisters, halfway through Lent, we make our prayer this today. God, we know you do not abandon us. Help us to feel your presence. Help us to carry the load. And Lord... You thirst for us. Help us to thirst more for you. Deepen our interest, our desire to know you, to pray, to study, to serve. And Lord, the people whom we know who do not thirst for you, in this Lent, draw them back through your grace, through our prayers. Spark a thirst in them. Lead them to conversion. Maybe to come back to confession in this season of Lent. Maybe to come back to Mass at this Easter. Lord, we thirst. Deepen our thirst. Amen.